folks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Aran. I uh, work on the infrastructure product partnerships team at uh, Facebook. And uh, today we're going to talk to you guys about software solutions on OCP gear. Um, so to just kind of set the stage a little bit, um, sometime in the middle of last year, uh, the infra product partnerships team at Facebook was looking at the OCP ecosystem and we were trying to figure out what it is we can do to help accelerate things even faster. And one of the things that stood out to us was the relative lack of commercial software solutions that were known to be uh, good um, or validated on top of OCP gear. And so we, we set out to uh, try and help uh, fix that and we established the disaggregate lab where we basically filled it up with a bunch of OCP gear and we invited both software solution makers as well as adopters to come and experiment with the gear. The software solution providers basically test their solutions or applications on the gear and gain the confidence that it's capable of supporting it. And adopters can overcome some barriers of landing infrastructure initially and uh, actually get to, the, to trial and test OCP gear before they, uh, before they commit. Um, and so today we're gonna welcome a panel of reps from these various companies who are gonna talk about uh, software solutions on open hardware and what that, what that means. Um, but before I, uh, before I invite the panel on, I wanna take a moment to talk about the term that we tend to use a lot, disaggregation. Um, when, when the word is, is said, people tend to think about the separation of hardware and software, and that is definitely an aspect of it or a cornerstone. Um, but really, for us, disaggregation means um, taking control of the full infrastructure stack and having the flexibility and the freedom to choose perhaps multiple pieces of hardware and software in the combination that serves your workload best. And it's really the fact that web scale workloads evolve very rapidly and in somewhat of an unpredictable fashion um, that demands this sort of approach. Um, because what is today a perhaps a very effective and economical solution can quickly become one that isn't uh, as the workload transforms. And if you don't have the ability to go into the right pieces of the infrastructure and adapt, um, you, will ba you could basically land on a challenging TCO. So with that said, um, I'd like to invite uh, the panel up here and start our discussion on um, open hardware, getting software solutions to work on it, and disaggregation. So uh, first, I'd like to invite uh, J.R. Rivers from Cumulus, uh, founder and CTO. Hey. Thanks, Jeff. Next, I'd like to invite Mark Shuttleworth, uh, founder and CEO of Canonical. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Vincent Su, an IBM fellow and the CTO for the storage and software defined environments. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Next, uh, I'd like to invite Scott Dawkins, the VP of the Advanced Technology Group from NetApp. And, and founder of nothing. He's <laughs> <laughs> on the stage. He's on the stage. <laughs> thanks for coming. And last but not least, Chris Wright, Vice President and Chief Technologist from Red Hat. Thank you. So um, I think maybe we'll start off with, uh, with perhaps uh, Vincent or Scott. Um, I think the big question that everybody's wondering about is why did you enable your solutions on top of OCP hardware and OC uh, an open hardware, excuse me, and OCP <laughs> specifically? Okay, let me start on this one. Uh, we have been on this journey for quite some time that, uh, in fact, we rebrand our story solution. I mean, for like three, four, three, four years ago, we have seen this, uh, this, this trend. So we, we architect our softwares, and uh, to our vision, our strategy here is provide a consistent storage capability across three different deployments, commodity hardware, open hardware, storage as a services on cloud, and appliance. So, and then we, we architect our software to fit into the software suite called Spectrum, Spectrum Storage. For example, that, you know, we have a storage system called XIV, and we re-architect the software so today you can get the same storage capability on the cloud at the software packaging and, um, and, uh, and appliance, okay? 
And the next question is why OCP? So if you look at that three deployment model, the cloud, the software uh, only, and uh, the appliance, the working with OCP sort of uh, give us addressing two, sec two very important segments, which is the cloud and uh, the, the open hardware segment. So that's what we, uh, you know, we definitely, we are very uh, eager to work with OCP in this area. Sure uh, uh, similar journey. The, um, what we're following and how we deploy um, uh, software for storage and data management is following customers' choices for deploying applications, because ultimately that drives the decisions in IT. Um, and there's a wider range of choices of where to deploy apps than there ever has been. Sometimes uh, infrastructure customers own and operate, and sometimes they want commodity hardware, particularly larger scale data centers. Um, they really do want to be able to have a standardization and consistency across the, the hardware fleet and deploy all kinds of software loads. That's one option. Um, another option is um, at service providers or at scale um, and, and those sorts of deployments. And then a third is on, on uh, hyperscale. So we've moved from a, from a tightly integrated only um, way to deploy systems into a wider range. We'll do engineered systems. We'll do um, software on customers' hardware, and we'll deploy solutions um, on, on hyperscale. And I'll take your comment on, on uh, disaggregation actually a step further, which is um, as application architectures move into um, um, more services or microservices-based style of interaction with infrastructure, I think we need to follow by, by, by re-delivering what we do for storage or data management as a set of, of services. And then that takes us even farther into software-defined direction. And then it's compatible with whatever the physical infrastructure is, and those building blocks can continue to evolve. That's a good point. Um, so next kind of uh, ne next thing I was wondering about, uh, uh, maybe Scott or Mark, you may have a comment on this. What were your thoughts about the experience in working on this aggregate lab? Um, what what do you think about that model? How does that work in your eyes? Uh, well, I, I didn't have the privilege of participating. <laughs> But I can tell you that the reflected messaging was great. The, 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 the sense was that it had uh, a sort of very valley-centric buzz around it, and it was attracting a lot of innovators circling around you know, what was a new class of substrate that those innovators could all target. Right? And I think that's really what, for me, this is all about. Um, historically, innovation had to come from the few organizations that controlled the boxes. And we all know, especially around here, that innovation comes from you know, much faster if you, if, you, if you allow anybody to have the idea. And so I, I, that, that's the impression that I got, that the lab really attracted that crowd, right? And it's unleashing that that's exciting. And I, I guess I didn't answer your question of why LCP. So I'll wrap it in the same way. Um, I also personally haven't done the work in the lab, but I talked to our guys who have. And it, they found to be um, incredibly collaborative, um, certainly advancing the state of the art quickly. Um, bringing up our software-defined product on, on OCP was still kind of a port. Um, and so I think that's, that's an area to continue to work on this, this innovation, right? I, there still has to be an abstraction layer underneath, underneath an operating system. And Linux takes us part of the way, certainly. But there's still you know, better, better consistency on driver interfaces. And then it's, it's the stupid stuff, you know, all the gunk around environmentals and and um, check-in temperatures and, and light, sensors on the fans. system. Yes, lights, <laughs> light pipes. Oh my God, light pipes. Um, so I think there's still room to continue to reach that vision of that interoperability when we come down from a from a you know a, a big body of a, of work in a in a, in a storage-centric operating system. But the but the pace of progress is great. Yeah, I want to offer my thanks to the uh, the OCP team, uh, Wales and uh, Michaels. I mean, this integration, is, this this collaboration experience is great. I mean, we we bring out the box. Actually, it's record times. You know, this, we have we're not being. I mean, granted, we have been on this software journey for quite some time, but still, a new hardware is bring up the record time compared to some unknown hardware. It's you know, it's because of the team. We truly work together very well. So that, that's definitely great to hear from our side. And yeah, hopefully we can continue kind of this buzz and this momentum. Yes. So Chris, uh, maybe a question for you. Um, how do you see the transition of the work that's happening into this aggregate lab to deployment of the solutions uh, from in a production environment? What does that journey maybe look like? I think it's a critical step. So the initial step is really the, the, the server design. So you've got a specification 
And getting a specification into production requires real hardware. And the, the value of the disaggregate lab, to me, it's sort of like the, the old school plug fest where we come together and we can work out some of the early stage issues that you don't see in a design specification. You just can't uh, certify real enterprise type workloads to a piece of paper like that. So uh, you know, putting, putting this into those early stage, uh, you know, all, of, all the descriptions that, that we just heard in terms of figuring out if the fans work, the lights work, what's the BIOS bug or the firmware issue that, that is actually making this, uh, keeping this from working in conjunction with the software on top and then putting it into real workloads. And that will help really uh, improve the adoption rate uh, into the industry. And I think that's what's so exciting about right now. Uh, you know, OCP is not new. It's been around for a while, but it's really transitioned from what I would say the early stage, uh, you know, clear adoption internally at, at Facebook and then kind of more in the science experimentation phase of the, of the project to real work, lots of hardware vendors building real hardware and uh, our customers asking for this kind of uh, hardware to put into their data centers. I really like the, the term plug fist. I actually hadn't thought of that <laughs> term in this context, but I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's, uh, at least for my hardware days, plug fest usually referred to the, like the literal hardware plugging <laughs> in, and I think here we're plugging in some software, but nonetheless, it's, yeah. it's the same exercise, yeah. so. So, JR, um, we've, we've kept you quiet, so um, I'm wondering, um, <laughs> that's it, it's over. <laughs> now you're gonna have to say something. Um, if you're looking forward a few years, um, what do you think is maybe a potential, a surprising, but influential uh, product or paradigm that may emerge as a result of this kind of disaggregation approach? Something we may have not thought about or really dived into yet. That's a really weird one to ask because it's, um, it's, it seems so clear to me where the, where the whole thing's going, right? In that, um, I often get asked about technology, right? I'm, I'm a Mac fan, I like my Mac. But Mac is a scale of one, right? Facebook is a scale of hundreds of thousands, right? And if you look at IT technology that most people here are listening to, you're kind of dealing in that kind of a number. And when you chase that down, what you really need to do is have kind of, I'll call it clarity of supply chain of any component. So you, you know, again, back to your thought around disaggregate, what does it really mean? It means decomposing pieces and as, as a customer or a consumer, you might choose to get them all from one spot. You might choose to get them from different spots. But the fact that they're kind of individually visible and have meaning and can stand alone allows them to move at their own pace. And it, it also kind of creates a transparency between consumer and provider that hasn't always existed, right? You know, I, um, I happen to know Frank Frankowski reasonably well. And when he first started OCP, his biggest issue was the fact that there's all these people that had the ability to build great hardware and they had no way to get it to a customer and there's no way for these customers that really actually wanted that great hardware to get access to it even though it existed and so I, I really think over the next few years it's going to be a, a lot of what you're seeing today where it's just more and more of that path I think you're going to you know I guess the biggest thing I think you're going to see a lot of people that are traditionally hardware companies move away from that because it's just not effective for them all right, so maybe a little follow-up question. Mark, we had talked about kind of potential innovations that might be really readily realized for developers or operators or kind of the third parties that are leveraging those, those frameworks. Do you have any thoughts about, about that and what might be unleashed here? Yeah, and you know, there's these two kind of very elegant ideas in technology. One is the, elegance, the elegant responsibility of owning everything, right, the way Apple does it. And there's, there's something really beautiful about that, right, the complete ownership of the whole problem. And in some level, I think everybody aspires to that clarity. There's also something really compelling about less, right? You know, why did VMs just demolish the hosting industry well, when they're so much less, right? Well, because they're cheaper, quicker, faster, more accessible, all of those things. Why are containers exploding, right? Because they're less, which is sort of perverse, right? You give someone less and they love you more. Right? <laughs> Why, why is that? Well, because the more accessible, the more consumable, the more engaging, the easier to innovate, innovate right? And, and you know, the, the, there's beauty on both ends of that spectrum. What I love about what's going on here is that it allows somebody who has like a really interesting idea to do much less, but to do that bit really, really well. And, and you have to have a community to do that because they're essentially trusting that all the other things will be well done. But if you can prove that you have a community, if we can get to the point where 
racks just show up and it doesn't matter who they came from, they just work and nobody has to think about that. We're kind of unleashing a new level of creativity, right, which the, the you know, it's hard to predict what that will, what that will produce. Um, I do see um, what I would call sideways innovation. You know, we, we, if you look at networking or, or, or other stacks of storage, I think it's super interesting. You know, you clearly have these places where people can go very, very, very deep. And the bigger they are, the more competence they have in that, the deeper they can go. But I think it's what's super interesting now is because we can put all, like interesting things next to that stuff, we can do, for example, big data on storage, you know, analytics on storage in real time, or, or deep packet inspection or intrusion detection on the switch. You know what I mean? And so you've got diverse innovators collaborating. And that, to me, is really it's hard to beat. I, I like your point about kind of uh, keeping it simple or minimal, um, and in many ways I think that actually does also harken back to the origins of the OCP project and kind of Amir Michael dubbing the freedom servers as vanity free, which kind of remains a term and I think a, a philosophical approach to design to this day for, for OCP, so I like that. Um, so going back to, to uh, the IBM and NetApp, do you guys um, foresee any product features that become more viable or powerful as a result of this new approach? Oh, absolutely. Um, certainly the, the ability to, to um, evolve the where software is relative to hardware assets is a key one. I, the, the trend towards the Internet of Things or machine-generated data or the real time is going to drive this in spades. There'll be work that's really close to where the data is generated. There's regional, there's, there's back office that gives you this entirely new, new architecture between data, data and application and systems. And that's going to be, it's going to be a ripe territory for this. And then the other is um, some technologies coming that are really fundamentally changing the data path. You know, 100 gig Ethernet is, is, is on the horizon and, and storage class memories. Um, or, or, or NVMe kind of connectivity that, that is incredibly low latency. And so that, that what's in the software, what's in the hardware, how are those pieces architected has to evolve and evolving together is, um, is going to be very effective. I think that, uh, that people like this disaggregation because they can, they can uh, optimize you know, uh, the whole, whole stack differently. Um, the problem is this aggregation, the, what people don't want is the the, the effort they have to spend on the integrations, right? So I think that this call for the next level of integration software, like, you know, to be able to manage this scale out, disaggregated resources as a one. And on top of that, we also see that people start to look for, because of the scale nat uh, nature of it, start to apply the cognitive or artificial intelligence capability to be able to, you know, prevent predict the failure and start to take a precautionary effort, I mean, measurement uh, around those failures. So you will see those, uh, I believe those, those kind of the next level, next generation of the management software are gonna become key for the success of this effort. So I think there is one cautionary note though, um, which is that in disaggregating, we are leaving the end user with a profound new responsibility, which they wouldn't have had in a NetApp, in a SAN type mm -hmm. environment which is to, to keep all of those parts working. And there's a, there's, a, there's a great big red herring, which is to be so in love with what's possible that you forget what's practical. And that's particularly difficult, I think, if you're a giant institution, a Facebook or an Azure or a, an AWS or a Google, you, what's practical for you is completely different than what's practical for Main Street, right? And so that wanted to give real, Chris, too many of my secrets, one of the things that really drove Canonical and Ubuntu's success in OpenStack was that we didn't get drawn into any of the billion things of what's possible and focused very much on how do you actually enable Main Street to just stand up an OpenStack that works? Just that, right? And so it's, this is an interesting challenge here is we're opening up Pandora's box and we're making incredible things possible We've got to be really careful not to leave the potential consuming audience with what amounts to a giant validation and inter integration problem, right? Which they're super not qualified to handle, right? Just because it's not fun and why, you know, it's expensive. So, so that's, the, that's the interesting challenge and I think there's lessons to be learned from OpenStack in, in this forum as, as we go down that road. I, I would agree with that. It, it certainly moves around the boundaries when we say modular open system architectures. 
And so you're still assuming some point where, where disparate pieces come together. I agree with it. It also changes some of the, the management yeah. kinds of problems. And so some standardization. S SLAs. Standard. What's, an, what's an SLA in a world where mm -hmm. everything came from a different party? Right. How do you, how do you manage that? What are, the right, what are the right approaches to that? I think the way that always falls into always scale of one and scale of hundreds of thousands. And realistically, I think if you look at most of these problems, you can use those as your extremes and recognize that things are going to trend one way or the other. So you know, like kind of to your classic, you know, no offense, your NetApp approach, those days are going to be tight because people that are in that middle spot are likely to start taking workloads other places because they don't have the ability to hire someone, learn it. The, it's not the, the right scale for them. And so you know, you know, got to applaud NetApp for thinking outside the box and figuring out how they exist in that new world where they can take their technology and make it go to scale of one as well as you know, scale of thousands. Yeah, well, and large enterprise is already at a huge scale. I mean, if, if you come back and say, okay, in, in enterprise IT, the problem is how do I manage a whole bunch of applications and a whole bunch of data? Right. That's the, it's a, it's a 100,000 scale. Yeah, but even no I mean, in what fairness, what like a lot of the enterprises that, that I get to deal with, it used to be that a business unit got to choose their IPM infrastructure. Nobody can afford to do that anymore because the Correct. capacity, I mean, there's this arms race between our ability to generate data, our ability to collect and store data, and our ability to, to analyze the data. And those things are fighting against each other so fast, no one can keep up, right? So yep. to, to keep up, you have to have super efficient and super scalable people, which means you don't get to make these little tiny micro decisions anymore. Yeah, part of the problem is the explosion of data we're talking about, right? Because of, you know, machine generated data and then just a sheer amount of data generated. So you cannot locally optimize that. So uh, yeah. the client I'm, I'm working with now, they start to look at the problem as a whole, not just, yeah. you know, I optimize it locally and then at, at the end of the time, the, at the end of the day, I have the you know, inefficiency across my board. I was at Cisco when John Chambers made this famous quote. He said, uh, voice will be free. And his general, his general thinking at the time was that, you know, we're going to get to a point where data consumes most of the interconnect between people and the, the part that's dedicated to voice is minuscule overall. And we've, we've clearly gotten there. I think you can st start looking at Library of Congress being free right now in terms of storing data, right? You know, the people are generating so much data on a daily basis. Correct. Yeah. Some of it is arguably not that valuable, but yeah, a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are a lot a of cat videos. <laughs> with, uh, Depends on who, to who, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You guys, you guys have all the cat videos, right? <laughs> oh, well, a good portion of that, um, many, many copies of the cat videos. But, but you know, this, this maybe brings kind of a, another way of thinking about it. We're seeing this emergence of, say, uh, ML, right? And can ML help us with all the useless data that's being stored for no reason? That's uh, why so. I think that uh, follow what I talk about, uh, this next generation of management software, to start to apply the cognitive capabilities, the MLs and DLs on those data. It's you know, super important for this, this address this scale problem. You guys so, are super chill about your own redundancy here, I've got to say. This is this, so, this ML person that we're all going to hire. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, I, I'm the other way around. I'm, I'm with the box of photos that nobody ever opens again. How the hell do I keep that box from growing too big? <laughs> So, so uh, one of the questions that I had that I think you guys really jumped, in, jumped into is um, what are some of the biggest challenges for this approach? So I'll skip that because you guys kind of all participate and I think you did highlight some challenges and, and I think it is important to recognize that this is a journey, it is a process, it will come with its challenges. The question is, you know, what is the end benefit? And again, kind of closing back, um, provided you can kind of mount this beast, the, the flexibility and the control that you then have to make sure that you're running efficiently with your workload is, is really kind of the advantage looking forward. Um, we're almost out of time, so I wanted to, to close up with a question for the, the, the perhaps more software folks, but now that you guys are becoming software folks as well, you may want to answer it on, from, on your own regard. <laughs> what are some of the features that you'd like to see in the open hardware? that perhaps have not been unlocked yet that could help in your mission of delivering your applications and services on top of that? One thing that I'm interested in is um, the security space. So you've got platforms today that allow you to do some kind of attestation and trusted boot, but there's really kind of an unclear trust through the entire supply chain. So we have an opportunity here as we're exposing all the individual components and getting clarity on really whose role in the supply chain, who owns their, their different roles in the supply chain, can we build something that's more interesting from a security and an open perspective rather than uh, what we have right now, which is mostly kind of still closed box security. 
I think that's that's a great one. That's a great Actually. one. Yeah, and, and, and pragmatically, I mean, there's probably a lot of hardware suppliers that don't want to hear this, but I think the most innovative thing that could be done is like the boringest, which is to to make effectively exact replicas of something that's known to work, as opposed like a lot of OCP stuff. In fairness, gets kind of branded OCP, but it never you know never quite made through an OCP process, so it's different. So you have all these people trying to figure out how to digest different things and why they matter or don't matter. But um, you know, I, I was. I was at Google working for Steven Stewart, and, and he gave me a week to figure out what my job was or the job of the infrastructure group, and I figured it out. You know, luckily, I was super lucky. It's basically small amount of shit comes in, reasonable amount of stuff comes out, and the infrastructure's group is to do as much compute in between for as low as amount of money as possible, and that's true of every infrastructure group in the world. That's what they do. And so being able to ease the hardware acquisitions and sourcing burden from those people so they can take new technology with faith, get it in, find the right software to work on it or develop the software, whatever it takes to get software happening, but be able to trust that hardware, it's super huge. And differentiation doesn't tr cause trust. That's my, I don't know if you guys agree, but that's my no, take it's, on it. No, it's good, and, and uh, you know, we, we like to see, even, even the simple stuff, the SaaS controllers, we want to see that they're standardized and have the standard API, so people don't have to invest uh, more efforts to manage those. And the other things we'd really like to see is be able to do this predictive failure analysis, be able to know ahead of time so we can take precaution and have a measure around those failures. Keep that ML guy busy. Yeah. <laughs> so on that note, um, I'll, I'll thank you. Um, I'm sorry, did you have a... Did I was just going to add one more, which is, um, and it's for, really for the community, think, think of this as also a vehicle for um, being consistent in, in industrial design. Um, and and that, that also matters for our customers at large scale is, is the consistency because it goes to the efficiency in our data centers. Just from my perspective, I, I love the security opportunity, which is what yeah. it really is. But I also care a lot about just wasted friction. So things like firmware updates, right? How can we en engineer a world where they just happen, they improve security all the time rather than retarding security, and, uh, and, and they become kind of an invisible thing just make, that just gets better all the time, right? As we open things up, how do we make that not become worse, but rather actually make it, make it better? Great, I think that's a, a great conclusion point. I really thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Uh, I think we've managed to do great work together, and I look forward to uh, continuing to disaggregate. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.